there is a lot of discussion going on right now and controversy about vaccine mandates. So a question comes up, how well are these vaccines working in real life? Yes, the clinical trial data all look good in the beginning, but now that hundreds of millions of Americans have received one of these vaccines, we want to know how well it's working, especially because we hear about the need to get a booster shot or the need to vaccinate very young children. This situation is far from over, far from being under control. So we want to know naturally what is the real world performance of these vaccines. Hello everyone, I'm Naveen Agarwal and welcome to my weekly video update. So in this video, I will talk about a report that was published very recently by the CDC in their weekly mortality and morbidity report. So I'm going to give you a link to that uh, report and the website because I know many of you like to dig deeper into the details so you can understand at a deeper level. And that's exactly what we are trying to do on this channel. We want to look at the information published in technical and medical papers, in journals which are of high credibility, sources which are of high credibility. We want to review that data, analyze it, understand it, and then talk about it in a very simple, easy to understand way. So if you're new to this channel and would like to learn more about these topics, which are changing very fast, subscribe to this channel and leave a comment or question below that is top of mind for you. And I would love to follow up as soon as I possibly can. And many times I create new videos based on the questions and comments from viewers like you. Okay, so in this video, we will review the information uh, published in this report, what conclusions they reached, uh, what it means, and most importantly, what it does not mean. It's only one study, right? So we need to understand it within its own context and scope and understand to which extent we can generalize these conclusions. So we'll talk about that towards the end and also discuss how you should begin to understand this information so you can continue to make decisions which are lowering your risk and your families of risk in, in these very difficult circumstances still. So we'll talk about that. First, let's review the information and some key conclusions that are published in this report. And again, I'll give you a link as part of this video. So uh, this is comparing vaccine effectiveness or VE from real world data. They looked at patients who were already in the hospital and they are looking at the effect of Pfizer, BioNTech vaccine, Moderna vaccine and j, &J vaccine in the context of positive for COVID or negative for COVID. So this is published in this report, hospitalized patients March 11 to August 15 timeframe. And again, remember this is the timeframe where Delta variant was dominant and still continues to be dominant right now. So it might be pretty relevant information. 21 US hospitals across 18 states. So it's pretty broadly distributed, about 3,700 adults. That data, the data from these adults was selected for analysis as part of this study because of the controls they applied, 18 and older. Now they are making a conclusion for vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19 hospitalizations. Moderna, 93%, Pfizer, BioNTech, 88%, and J&J, 71%. So we can see that there's a difference between the mRNA vaccine effectiveness and the DNA viral vector vaccine from j, &J which is a single shot vaccine. Having said that, the numbers are still pretty high, right? 71% is still a pretty high number, but there's a difference. And even among the mRNA vaccines, there's a difference between Moderna and Pfizer-BioNTech. Some of the reasons could be that Moderna is, has contains a higher amount of mRNA, 100 microgram versus 30 microgram. And Moderna vaccine is given four weeks after the first dose. The second dose is four weeks after the first dose compared to three weeks after the first dose for Pfizer-BioNTech. So those differences may be contributing to a higher effectiveness for Moderna. And it is being shown in many other studies as well. But bottom line is that all three vaccines still seem to have pretty high number. But keep in mind, this is only against COVID-19 related hospitalizations. They also looked at IgG levels, anti-receptor binding domain. They looked at anti-spike protein as well. Among healthy volunteers, about 100 or so, that's a separate study, two to six weeks after full vaccination. 
and they are finding Moderna vaccinated volunteers to show about 4,000 binding antibody units per cc, Pfizer BioNTech about 3,000 and J&J about 51. Now, let me say this, there is a lot of interest and questions about relationship between certain level of antibodies and protection. People have asked me over and over again, what is the minimum level of antibody we need in our system to have some confidence, some level of protection? And it's quite frustrating for me personally that CDC and FDA have not come out with a committed definitive guidance on it. But they keep pointing to the correlation between antibody levels and vaccination immunity. They keep talking about that without telling us exactly what is the minimum threshold. They just haven't done that. So I'm going to speculate this a little bit, right? Just because we need to understand this and make some decisions. If I were to draw the line at 70% effectiveness minimum, we could say we need about 50 to 100 binding antibody units per mil as, 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 a, as just a minimum level. Now, having said that, 50 on one test may not be the same as 50 on another, so you have to be careful about that. But we would like to see about 50 to 100, right, as, as a minimum to make sure that we have some level of protection. But I hope a more definitive guidance will be provided by CDC and FDA. But in the meantime, we don't need to have thousands of antibodies per mil. You know, 50 to 100 could be sufficient. That's what I'm thinking right now. And again, I'll keep an eye on more information in this regard and share with you as it becomes publicly available. But share in your comments below your, your comments and questions about this particular topic the minimum level of antibodies versus protection. Have you come across any other information that could be relevant for us? Do you have questions, concerns, what kind of antibody levels you are seeing for your, your results? And people have shared that information previously on my channel. So I would love to hear that from you. This will be an ongoing topic of discussion. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, in general, they are finding much higher rate of COVID positivity among unvaccinated patients. So before I go into the results, let me describe how they analyze the data. So this, is, this method is called case control method, and they use some concepts of test negative study design. What they are doing is that they are looking at patients in the hospital already, okay? And they are separating them by a measured test positivity or test negativity for COVID-19. So they are, the case study group is patients who are testing positive and control group is patients who are testing negative. And all of these patients are hospitalized with COVID-like symptoms. That's also another control that they apply. And then they are looking at the effect of vaccination on the COVID status, COVID positive or COVID negative. That's what they're looking at. So what did they find? In general, they're finding that those who are in the hospital and unvaccinated, they have a higher rate of COVID positivity. So first look at vaccinated. They found about 219 cases out of 1327, 16%. I'll give you a breakdown by, by vaccine type. Unvaccinated, 1460 out of 2362, 62%. Much higher, much higher rate of COVID positivity among unvaccinated people who are in the hospital. Now let's look at the breakdown by vaccine type. Moderna, 11%, Pfizer, 17%, and J&J, about 33%. J&J, they had much, much smaller data set. But in general, the rate of COVID positivity among people who received only one shot of J&J and are in the hospital is much higher than the Moderna mRNA and uh, Pfizer mRNA vaccine. Now, I also noticed some two interesting facts. Unvaccinated group generally was younger. Median age was 53 versus 61 to 68 for the vaccinated group. And in general, a higher proportion of minority groups was represented in the unvaccinated group. Higher percent of minority groups with J&J vaccine compared to Moderna or Pfizer BioNTech. So I've heard that Moderna, Moderna Pfizer BioNTech uh, our mRNA vaccines, they require, you know, special handling, some limitations in distribution. And J&J single shot vaccine is considered to be like an outreach vaccine. Uh, it's still a pretty good vaccine, but for some reason, and it's consistent with what I have heard, is now going into more uh, minority groups and difficult to reach people. 
uh, as far as vaccination is concerned. So this seems to be consistent in this data set as well. So uh, I want to dig deeper into how they calculated vaccine effectiveness. It'll be interesting to see because it's slightly different than how they do the calculation for a clinical trial data set. Because remember, this is an observational study. This is not a clinical trial. This is after the fact. So we're going to take the example of the data set for Moderna vaccinated people. So what they do is that they look at vaccinated versus unvaccinated and COVID plus versus COVID minus. So in this scenario, 54 vaccinated uh, individuals tested positive for COVID and 422 vaccinated individuals tested negative. Among the unvaccinated group, 1463 were COVID positive and 899 were COVID negative. So what they do is that they calculate something called an odds ratio. It's a ratio of two ratios. Odds ratio in this case is in the COVID plus column, 54 divided by 1463 divided by COVID negative column, which is 422 divided by 899. And that comes out to about 0 0.07. Now they do a lot of other fancy statistical analysis, a lot of modeling to adjust this odds ratio for some factors that may be confounding the analysis. And based on that, they do a vaccine effectiveness calculation as one minus OR, which is odds ratio multiplied by 100, adjusted odds ratio. But I did just the crude calculation of this 0 0.07 and I come to 93, 93% for Moderna, which is consistent with what they are reporting. But keep in mind that they did more sophisticated analysis and they adjusted the VE for the following factors. Admission date to the hospital, geographic region, age, sex, race and Hispanic ethnicity. So they do really a lot of good analysis to make sure that their numbers are reliable. Analysis is reliable, they're using best methods, uh, but even a rough calculation shows you pretty much consistent results with what they're reporting, so 93%. Now, the modeling that they did, statistical modeling they did, allowed them to predict vaccine effectiveness over time. So let's look at what they found out there. Vaccine effectiveness was estimated to decrease, but it still remained high. That's the conclusion I make. 14 to 120 days versus greater than 120 days. And this is after full vaccination. So for Moderna, 93% versus 92%. So it's pretty, pretty good, even after, let's say, four months. Pfizer, BioNTech, on the other hand, 91% versus 77%. And I think it's consistent with what we have also heard directly from, from Pfizer, that uh, they expect the level of protection to go down over time for their vaccine, and that's why they're actually promoting the Pfizer-BioNTech booster shot so, uh, so aggressively. So it's consistent. Now, they could not do this analysis for J&J because their data set was, was very small. So I hope this uh, was interesting information for you uh, and uh, something that we can all look at. But let's understand what it means and what it does not mean, right? To what extent can we generalize these conclusions? First is limited to only COVID-19 related hospitalization. So we do understand that if you are in the hospital and vaccinated, chances are very low that you will be COVID positive, even though you might have COVID-like symptoms. But to what extent can we generalize it? That if you are vaccinated and in the general population, you come down with COVID, you will have to go to the hospital. To what extent can we say that? And to, to on that question, I'm still on the fence because this is only one study. Uh, it is only limited to those who were actually admitted to the hospital and they took great care. They took great care to avoid confounding of factors. But it is quite possible that many people will not go to the hospital even they are vaccinated or unvaccinated and they get COVID or many people are not able to. They don't have access to seek medical care. So there might be those differences in general. So. I would not expect the same number to apply generally, but I would expect the numbers to be pretty high. Maybe not 93%, but maybe a little bit lower than that, but it's, it'll be good, still good protection. That's how I understand this data, is that risk against COVID-19 hospitalizations, if you're vaccinated, is substantially lower than if you are vac unvaccinated. I think this is consistent with that understanding. So the most important, I think, result is the 
protection level is going down, the effectiveness is going down over time. And that is why the conversation about boosters is very relevant. It's uh, also relevant because it has been shown to boost the antibody levels and I've talked about that in several of my videos. In fact, there's a very recent video you can check out. It's about uh, mixed dose boosters, just released a few weeks ago. You can check that out. So conversation of boosters is very important. We talked about antibody levels, right? Even though there is no definitive line in the sand, if you have noticed changes in your antibody levels and they are going down, have a conversation with your doctor about a booster shot, especially if you receive J&J vaccine as a primary vaccine. I think there's a very strong recommendation uh, and that's why anybody who got the J&J vaccine as a primary vaccine can go get a booster shot just after two months. Uh, they are eligible. They can go get a booster shot. So you might want to consider a booster shot uh, if you have seen a decrease in your antibody levels or you had the J&J vaccine as your primary vaccine. So a lot to come in this area, right? We are understanding every week, every day, new information is coming. But overall, it should continue to build our confidence in the effectiveness of these vaccines. I think it is being shown over and over again that it is holding, it is holding steady. And really getting a large proportion of our population vaccinated is a good idea. Now, I'm, I'm not going to say much about vaccine mandates, even though we started with that. It's a context in which we are talking about this. But please share your thoughts and comments. Would it help? Would it hurt? Uh, I would love to hear from you. So, uh, so drop a note below and let's have a good discussion. I really enjoy hearing from you. So keep that coming. Look forward to more discussion, more questions, comments from you. And I'll follow up as soon as I possibly can. I want to thank you for your interest and attention and I wish you safety and, and good wishes, especially as we come close to Thanksgiving. Please stay safe and take care.